no two lives are identical. Uh, you know, it's like snowflakes. We're, we're all separate, but we do share some common things in life. There are common things that happen to each and every one of us. And, and uh, I still hear a story that goes along with this as we are uh, getting ready to read this scripture. When I was a young man, I was, uh, you know, I, I, I grew up on a little farm and, and mom and dad made, made us work hard. And, you know, uh, looking back, I guess in a lot of ways we were somewhat isolated uh, from, you know, we wasn't, we wasn't a Lake City family. We wasn't a North family. We was right in the middle. We, was, we, was, we hung out in the middle. And, and so I, I never was a big ball player or anything like that. I, I like to try to play ball, but I was never very good. Uh, I just, you know, I, I, I wanted to be good but in my mind I could imagine that I was good but but in reality I realized looking back that I was never really good at ball and and that was just the fact of the matter so growing up if you're if you know those of you who are from here in town you know growing up you you fell into a couple categories you if you was good at ball then then that was pretty good you had a pretty good ticket to being part of the in crowd right I mean that was that was your your ticket to being part of the the of the of the of the elite crowd is you know you didn't have to be rich you didn't have to be you know famous but man if you could play ball then that was a, a free ticket or you know if if you did come from money that always helped as well because then you could finance the parties that all the other kids went to so that was always part of it you know uh, I was not a good ball player and my family didn't have money and I never did uh, was never part of that uh, I was a smart kid believe it or not you never you never know it from hearing me talk would you. But I was actually, I was actually in elementary school, I, uh, I was actually uh, considered a smart kid, and uh, I hung around with other smart kids. Uh, these days they call them nerds, uh, you know, and, and <laughs> uh, I, I, was, I, was, I was, but I wasn't a nerd either, I was just, I was just you know, I was, I was part of that outcast group. I, I didn't really fit in anywhere. I wasn't part of any really good social structure, you know. Uh, the kids that I hung around with today, uh, you know, uh, sometimes, I mean, I would sometimes hang around with ball playing kids. I would hang around with kids that were, you know, more or less outlaws. Uh, I would hang around with kids that, that, that was on the other side, uh, that, that back in those days, uh, you know, and this is really telling how you are. That was back when kids played Dungeons and Dragons. There was a, 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 uh, a game that came out called Dungeons and Dragons, and this was before video games. You know, and I know younger kids, you all don't understand, there was actually games before a screen popped them up. But, but there was kids that played that. But I didn't do any of those. I didn't do any of those. But I had good friends that did. One kid in particular, and I won't name this kid because uh, they still live in this community. I don't know, I haven't seen him in years. But I, uh, as I tell the story, maybe you, you relate. And, and, and I really liked this guy. He was, he was just one of those, those good guys to, to hang around with, just always just a good kid. You know what I mean? All around, I mean, he didn't, he was, he was part of the, 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 the kids that was smart, that played Dungeons and Dragons, very, a very smart guy, but he was just, just so stinking nice. I mean, you know, just drift with being nice, and, and, and just the type of person you like to be around, you know, but he wasn't very popular, and wouldn't want to be popular, and I remember that we went through school together, and as we got on into to middle school and high school, you know, the... Uh, you know, the desire to be a part of something, some group, you know, it drove us. You know, it drove, I think it drives everybody. Some people find their identity earlier than others, and you're comfortable with, with being part of one group or the other, and other people, they search for it. You know, and I was one of those guys that since I wasn't a ball player, and I wasn't, I was, you know, and when I discovered girls, my IQ dropped off the floor. I mean, I, I was once a smart kid, and I discovered girls, and man, that just tanked at, at that point. And, and I didn't realize how dumb I was until I discovered girls. And, and so I tried to fit in with whatever group, and I never will forget, and I know this is a long story, but I, I'll get there, okay, where this makes sense, is I remember one day I was hanging around with this group of guys, and this one nice kid was over there. And, you know, on all the guys back then, I don't know why, but we were in such a rush, uh, you know, to have physical relationships with girls at that point. And, you know, and we'd all stand around and brag about things we'd never done. And, uh, you know, and we would try to make ourselves look bigger than what we were, you know, and, and, and you know, we, we were the man, you know, no, not really, you know, we were a bunch of punk kids that didn't know any better than to, to brag about something you'd never done before. But, uh, but we, you know, this, this poor unfortunate kid, he was not one of those. He was not going to stand around and brag about something he'd never done. So when you're in a group of guys that are standing around lying and bragging about what you're doing and you've got one kid that won't lie about it, guess what? He became a lightning rod for abuse, you know. He became the guy that 
we all made fun of, you know, because he had never done that. He wouldn't brag about something he had never done. And the reason I tell you this story was because, you know, I had a choice. I had a choice because I had been that kid before. I had been the kid they had made fun of. So somewhere along the line, I had, I had found a way to reverse my fortune, so to speak, and I was, I was all of a sudden on this side of the fence, right, rather than being the one that was picked on. I had actually found my way and carved myself into the niche of the crowd that could make fun of somebody. And I remember thinking, as we was poking fun at this guy, I thought, I thought man, that is such a nice kid. Why are we doing this? That is such a nice guy. And, and then what really was bad, I remember going home that day, and I was like, gosh, I'm so ashamed. I'm so ashamed because I've been that guy before. I, I, I've, been, I've been on the receiving end of that. I've been on the receiving end of the abuse. I've been on the receiving end of being picked on. I've been on the receiving end of being talked down to and made fun of. And rather than doing the right thing and doing what I should have done and defend him or, or at least not partake of it, then what I did was I did the opposite. I, I just piled on even worse. You know, I made, I made his situation even worse because of the one guy that could have probably stood up and said, hey, you know what, it's not cool, leave him alone, was the one guy that, that, that forgot what it was like to be picked on. It, I, was, I was that one guy that forgot what it was like to be, be made fun of. And so I piled on. And I've told you that story because I want you to remember that as we go through this message this morning, I want you to remember that sometimes we forget, right? There are things that we forget. We forget what it's like, right? We forget what it's like to be that unfortunate one. And it talks about this, the 40th chapter of the book of Genesis is that it came to pass after these things that the butler of the king of Egypt and his baker had offended their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was wroth against two of his officers, against the chief of the butlers and against the chief of the bakers. And he put them in the ward of the house of the captain of the guard into the prison, the place where Joseph was bound. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them, and they continued a season in the ward. And they dreamed a dream, both of them, each man his dream in one night, each man according to the interpretation of his dream, the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, which were bound in the prison. And Joseph came into them, unto them in the morning and looked upon them, and behold, they were sad. And he asked Pharaoh's officers that were with him in the ward of his Lord's house, saying, Wherefore look ye so sadly today? And they said unto him, We have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me, I pray you. And the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said, uh, said to him, In my dream, behold, a vine was before me. And in the vine there were three branches, and it was as though budded, and their blossoms shot forth, and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. And the Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and gave the cup un into Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said unto him, this is the interpretation of it. <coughs> the three branches are three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head and restore thee unto thy place. <coughs> and thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into my hand after the former manner when thou, was, thou was his butler. But think on me when it shall be well with thee, and show kindness, I pray thee, unto me, and make mention of me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house. For indeed I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also have I done nothing that they should put me into the dungeon. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he said unto Joseph, I also was in my dream, and behold, I had three white baskets on my head. In the uppermost basket there was all manner of baked meats for Pharaoh, and the birds did eat them out of the basket upon my head. <coughs> and Joseph answered and said, This is the interpretation thereof. The three baskets are three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thy head from off thee, and shall hang thee on a tree, and the birds shall eat thy flesh from off thee. And it came to pass on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast unto all his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief butler and, the ser and of the chief baker from among his, ser among his servants. And he restored the chief butler into his butlership again, and he gave the cup un into Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted unto them, yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. A lot of reading right there, but it's a good story. Now, you may wonder why Joseph was in prison. So, uh, so Joseph was in prison because he wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't do the wrong thing. You see, Joseph was made a chief in Potiphar's house, and Potiphar 
Joseph's wife had wanted Joseph to lay with her, and Joseph wouldn't do it. He said it wasn't the right thing to do, and, and she uh, was trying to seduce Joseph and failed, and she got a little mad about that, so she framed Joseph to make it look like he had tried to have his way with her. And, of course, you know, who's going to believe a little Hebrew servant? So they throw Joseph into the prison. You know, he was there without cause or without warrant. I don't know what this chief butler and baker did, but evidently they had made him, made Pharaoh mad, so they cast him in the prison too. So all three in the same lot, all three were there in prison together. And as they were there, uh, it talks about this dream that they had. Uh, how that the chief butler, how that he had, had dreamed this dream and how the interpretation of his dream was good. Man, it worked out well for chief butler, right? I mean, he dreamed this dream. He told Joseph, he said, listen, I've dreamed this. And Joseph looks at him and says, maybe three days from now, you're going to be restored. Everything's going to be great. And I just got one request of you. Whenever you get to get out of here, would you please remember to tell Pharaoh about me? Would you please remember that? Sure, I, I, but I'll tell you, I can just imagine there, you imagine the conversation, yeah, buddy, I, got, I really appreciate you interpreting that dream for me, you know. And the chief baker, of course, he sees how good it worked out for the chief butler. He's like, well, hey, tell me about my dream. Not so good for him. Important lesson that's a sidebar on this. Sometimes you don't want to know. And the chief baker should not have wanted to know. But it's, we show, we see as the story progresses how that, that the prophecy or the, the, the dreams came true, how that, that Joseph told them the truth and how that it worked out. But that very last verse there says, Yet the, did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. Now, can you imagine with me for a moment what it must have been like? I mean, here these, these men were, were in prison together, and they were, they were there, in, you know, that they had been through the suffering with each other. They had, they had been through all of that together. And yet, whenever it came time to remember that, he forgot. Now, I told you the story about me before, about forgetting. And the reason I want to tell you that story was because of this. It's because simply is sometimes we forget what it's like, right? We forget what it's like to be that person. We as God's children have a bad habit of forgetting what it was like to be lost. Remember what it was like when you were lost? Does anybody besides me remember what it was like? And you say, well, Brother Ray, I don't remember what it was like to be lost. I don't remember what it was like to be saved. Well, if you don't remember what it was like to be lost and you don't remember what it's like to be saved, then I would check and see what I got. Because I want to tell you, one of the things that happens as we as Christians, we get very comfortable in who we are. We get, we get saved, and man, it's all good, and we're all good. We got fire insurance, right? We're going to go to heaven, and we're not going to worry about anything else. We're not going to worry about what it's like for, uh, to be worried about hell. We're not going to worry about what it's like to live under the, the penalty of sin and shame and guilt. Or we were, we're saved by the grace of God, and we know that at any time, if we really want to be free from them, all we got to do is tap into the power of the Holy Spirit and just revel in the, the the knowledge of knowing that Jesus Christ died for us on Calvary so that we could be set free from all that. And man, is that not good as a Christian? Amen. I mean, is it not good to know that we're free from the burden of sin? That we do not have to worry about all of that stuff anymore? I know I'm glad. I can remember what conviction felt like as a lost person. And, and I, that's been one of my prayers all, all my life. Is God, don't let me forget what it was like to feel lost. I don't know why that that has been important to me in my life, but that's just been one of those things that, that ever since I was young when I got saved, I, I, I knew that there must be some importance about knowing what it felt like to be lost. Because I think so many times we as Christians don't remember what it's like to be lost. I think sometimes we get very comfortable in the fact that we're going to heaven. We get very comfortable in knowing the fact that we've been pardoned and that we're not guilty anymore. But sometimes we forget, right? We forget what it was like when we lived under sin and shame. Do you remember what that was like? Do you remember what it was like when you realized, when you came to the realization that, that, you're, that you were dying and going to hell? Do you remember what it was like to be afraid of that? I do. I remember as a nine-year-old boy, I remember my mom and dad bought me a, a, a toy gun set. And I, I, and I love to play war. I told you why God's a nerd, so don't judge me, okay? I mean, I, I was that kid. I loved to play war. So, I, and mom and dad bought me a toy gun set. And, and I wanted that toy gun set for years. I had my eye on it, okay? This was back when the Piggly Wiggly sold toys, right? 
Man, that sounds old, don't it? That was back when the Piggly Wiggly sold toys. There wasn't no such thing as a Dollar General around here. But they had this one, and man, it had, it had the little toy 45, it had the toy machine gun, had a toy hand grenade. And boy, man, I wanted that so bad. I could be a bad man if I had that. I'd wipe out everybody, all my enemies in front of me with that. And I remember that mom and dad, they came through for me. They came through for me on my birthday. And, and they must have known that I'd wanted it, and, and, and they brought it in there, and they set it down in front of me. And I remember having to fake being excited about it. Because when I looked at it, all I could see was death. I never will forget that. I remember when I looked at that toy, and I unwrapped it, and I, and I saw it. I was like, oh, my gosh. This represents death. And anything representing death absolutely scared me to death. I mean, it's, it frightened me to my core. Because I knew, see, the Lord had been dealing with my heart and conviction had set upon me. And I knew that if I died, I was going to go to hell. And I, was, I, I didn't want to think about death. I didn't want to say anything about death. I didn't want anything to die around me. I didn't want anything to even come to an end. I didn't even hate the movies where it said the end on the bottom of it because, it, to me, it absolutely frightened me to my core because I knew that one day that my life would come to an end and in the state that I was in at that point, I would die and go to hell. And it, and it, and it, was, it was beyond fright. It shook me to my very core. And I remember having to, it, to fake being excited about that. And mom and dad would say, you know, you go play with your gun? And I was like, yeah. And I would go out, and because I, I, I played, that was back when kids could actually go outside and play. And I went outside and played, and mom and dad would let me run in the woods. We had, you know, 40 acres of ground there. Hey, go, go, go find yourself somewhere in the woods. <coughs> in between that, me and my uncle was close to 100 acres there. They didn't know where I was at until dark, and Mom would holler and say, hey, come on in, it's time for supper, and they knew I wouldn't want to miss that. <coughs> but I would, I would hide them. I'd go to the barn, and I'd move a bale of hay, and I'd hide that stuff underneath the bale of hay, and I'd put the bale of hay, and then I'd go, and I would just hide in the woods, or I'd just go do something different because I didn't want to think about it. I didn't want to think about death. I didn't want to think about, about what came with that. But in my heart, I know now as a saved person, it's very important that I remember what it felt like to be afraid of that. Because whenever I see kids or I see young people or I see even adults that are talking about not being saved, I realize that if conviction has truly set it on their heart, they're scared to their very core. I don't want to ever forget that there are people that are living out here that are afraid of everything. And the reason they're afraid of everything is because they may not know that they have a security in Jesus Christ and the saving grace that comes through him. Amen. So I should, be, I should be remembering what it's like to be that afraid that when I would lay down my head on my pillow at night that I would lay there and tears would stream out of my eyes until my pillow was wet because I was so scared to close my eyes and go to sleep because if I didn't wake up the next morning, I knew that I would die and go to hell. And guess what? There may be people in your life today that are going through the exact same thing. Today we call it different things. They diagnose it, right? They diagnose things. They try to diagnose things as anxiety or depression or all these things. I think that modern-day science and doctors have actually got a lot of anxiety and depression confused with condition. They try to explain it away with some medical diagnosis. I'm going to tell you something. When the heart is troubled by the Holy Spirit, that is conviction. Thank God for it. Because I believe without conviction, there will be no salvation. And I'm very thankful for conviction. I'm very thankful that there is a stirring of the heart that comes by and it breaks everything up. I'm glad to know that God troubles our heart to the point to where we realize that we truly need him as a savior. I'm glad to know that today. Amen. And we as God's people should never forget that. Do you realize there's people out there that, that do you remember, maybe you're here and maybe the shame of the way you lived your life was so bad that you, you were scared to come to Jesus because of what you had done was so bad that you thought there was no way that Jesus would ever love you enough to die for your sins because your sins were so high and so big. And now you're on this side of it, and you're looking back, you're saying, man, I'm so glad that I'm saved by the grace of God. God came into my heart, and he released me from all that guilt and shame and all that pain. I am so glad that God came into my heart, and he made a way for me. He freed me from the bonds of sin and shame and, and death. And man, I am so thankful for that. But never forget there's people out there that don't know that. 
There's people out there today that are living under the bondage of their sin and shame. There are people out there that think that they are so bad that God will never have anything to do with them. Lord, help us if we forget. Lord, help us if we forget what it's like because I want to tell you what, I am one step removed from being that little lost boy that was so scared to lay his head down. I'm one step removed. And that step is the first step I took when I climbed out of the pew at Island Ford Baptist Church and I went and knelt down and asked Jesus Christ to be my Savior. You said, Brother Randy, you, you came a long way since then. I realized if it wasn't for that step, if it wasn't for that step, I could still be lost. If it wasn't for that first step, I could still be in my sins. If it wasn't for that first step, I could still be on my way to hell. And I'm so thankful that I'm just one step removed from that pain and that, that fear. And guess what? There's people out there that are just one step removed, amen, from the saving grace of God. Let's not forget them. Let's not forget them. Christians, it should be a time in our life as we look around and we, we claim about how bad the world is and how everything is going to pot. And, and man, this world is just destined for destruction. We should ever, ever be more concerned about those around us that are lost. The Bible describes it as this, as a field that is white and ready for harvest. But what else does he say about it? But the laborers be few. You know why? Because you forget what it's like to be hungry. When was the last time you was truly starving for something? I know we get hungry, right? I mean, you get, might get busy doing something during the day, or you might not have an opportunity to eat, you know, your fourth meal of the day. You know, how, you know what it's like. And, and you walk into the house, and you're like, oh, I am starving to death. I mean, seriously. Seriously. I mean, honestly, if you're here, you know, I don't want to see your hand, but if you had to go more than eight, hours between meals because you didn't have anything, please come see me. Please come see me. Because I guarantee you, most of us probably don't go four hours between meals unless we just plan it that way. But you realize there are people out there today that, that they honestly, they have ate the last meal they know where it's going to come from. The meal that they just had, the, the snack they just ate, was, might have been the very last meal that they, they were guaranteed that they knew where it was going to come from. They don't know where, what's next. They don't know what meal's going to be put in front of them. They don't know where food's going to come from. And yet, we forget about that, don't we? As we make our plans to go from one restaurant to the other or one meal to the next, we forget that there's people out there that, have, that, that don't even know where their next meal's going to come from. We forget. I think we forgot something. That butler, as he would come out of the prison, he had every opportunity to do something really good for Joseph, right? He had every opportunity to say, you know what, I remember what it was like to be in prison. I remember what it was like to be down there because I shouldn't have been. I remember what it was like to be somewhere because I had no choice. I remember what it was like. And Pharaoh, can I tell you about this guy? I mean, I, you've been, you, I thank you for bringing me out of the prison, but hey, I got to tell you about this man named Joseph, right? I got to tell you about this guy because, I mean, he, he interpreted my dreams and, and he's this really good guy and he was blamed for something that wasn't his fault. You've got to do something for him. You've got to help him. If they would have had a chance just like that, all he had to do was snap his fingers and he'd have been brought out. But the story goes on. It's two four years before, before as Pharaoh had dreamed a dream. And, and he says that then the butler was like, oh, yeah, by the way. My question is this. What is it going to take to shake you out of your forgetfulness? Oh, I'm sorry, my, 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 my grandkid or my child or my friend or my coworker uh, is down there at the hospital. They, they've been in a car accident or they've got a dire uh, disease, a diagnosis that, that is going to call for their life. Oh, yeah, by the way, I need to talk to them about Jesus. Oh, I, I, should, I should have been talking to them about the Lord this whole time. I, I just forgot about it, and life was so good. I was so blessed. I mean, I was driving nice cars and living in a nice house, and I was full all the time. I, I didn't even give it a second thought about talking to them about Jesus. But now there's a problem. They're down here sick, or they're down here in an accident, or something bad is going on in their life, or they, I just discovered they had an addiction, or I just discovered their marriage is breaking up, or whatever it is. And it's like, oh, yeah, by the way, now they talk to them about Jesus. That's the way we are, is it not? You don't have to say yes, because I know it. You don't have to say yes because that's the way we are. We wait till the catastrophe hits and then we try to act on it. We are what we call a reactive society. We, it takes some kind of stimulus for us to move, okay? We, I mean, it's like, you know, 
we wait for the pain to happen before we do anything about it. If we just saw it coming, we said, hey, I'll just move out of the way. Oh, no. We wait for it to happen. Then we try to act on it. And that's the way we do as Christians. I see my, I see my son tore up inside. Then I think, I, I, oh, son, let me pray with you. Why should I be? Why wasn't I praying with him the whole time? I, I see a, a co-worker that is, their family's tore all to pieces. And they, they come in and say, hey, you know, I, I need some help. Well, let's just pray about that. Why wouldn't we pray to start with? You see, we could solve a lot of the problems that had them off before they ever get there if we just wouldn't forget where we came from. We need to remember what it was like to be lost. You know what? That's the most important thing we can remember today is what it was like to be lost without God. Anybody ever been lost physically in this world? It's frightening when you're disoriented and you don't know where you're at. You know, I, I typically don't get lost except if you put me in a shopping mall. And it's very disorienting. All the stores are the same. Everybody looks the same. And it's, disor- and it's frightening to me. <laughs> I may be stuck in this group forever if I don't find a way out. If you've ever been lost in the woods or lost on the lake, I remember one time me and Dad went fishing. And we got out in the middle of the lake and the fog rolled in. And Dad said, we're just going to have to sit here. He said, I don't know which way to go. I was just a young boy. I said, don't know which way to go. He said, I, said, I, he said, I, can't, I couldn't tell you which way to go right now if I tried. He said, if we were to take off, he said, we could be total, headed totally the wrong direction. He said, we're just going to have to sit here until the fog burns off. And I was like, well, that's not good. You know, Dad should know where we're going. Dad should know where we're at. And when Dad don't know, it's time to panic. Christians, guess what? Lots of people look at us the same way. While we're wandering around acting like we don't know which direction to go, lots of people say, hey, if they don't know which way to go, then it's time to panic. Can I tell you something, as Christians, if we don't forget who we are, we should always know where we're at because we are just one step away from, from the, the, the lostness. We should, we're just one step away from the lack of salvation. We're one step away from being lost ourselves, but we're also one step away from heaven and we can point to the cross. If we just remember to do it. It's an amazing thing that we as God's people have forgotten who Jesus is. And I'm going to share one other scripture with you and I'm going to come to a close. If you want to turn with me this morning, and I may preach on this one day in the future, but just turn with me to the 61st chapter of the book of Isaiah. <coughs> the 61st chapter of the book of Isaiah. And it's talking about Christ here. I know it's Old Testament, but uh, for those of you who are not a fan of the Old Testament, guess what? Old Testament does point to Christ. Okay? So just, you know. So it says this, the 61st chapter of the book of Isaiah, first verse. It says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to come for all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. That... Same thing there. You say, well, that was Christ. That's Christ in us. That's what we are here for. I'm going to read that to you one more time. I'm going to ask if they will come and get a song. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to come for all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil, for joy, oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. That's our job. 
Folks, that's our job, to remember where we came from. My mama used to have a, have a uh, saying that she'd say, you forgot your raisins. You ever been told you forgot your raisins? You know, you get a little too big for your britches sometimes, and you, get, you, forget where you, you forget your raisins, you forget where you came from. We as God's people should never forget where we came from. You know, no matter where this world takes me, I'm always going to be a little old boy from the holler. That's all. I, that's that's my that's my background. You can take a boy out of the holler. You can't take the holler out of the boy. And you know what? We should always remember who we are with God. That it was by His grace and His mercy that He brought us through our fear, our guilt, and our shame. And we should remember to share that with everybody around us. As we stand, as we sing, if there's something that you would like to talk over with the Lord, please feel free to do so. This altar is always open.